Hi, everybody. This is Peter Schiff. It is Tuesday, December 8th, 2015. We are just about a week away from the Federal Reserve's first rate increase, supposedly, in the last 10 years. We're going to get the announcement next week on Wednesday. And pretty much everybody believes that the stage is set for liftoff based on the most recent data that we got on jobs. The non-farm payroll report came out on Friday last week, and it was better than expected. And supposedly the only thing that might have prevented the Fed from lifting off uh, next week would have been some kind of horrific jobs number. Not even just missing, but it was going to have to be really, really awful to dissuade the Fed uh, from raising interest rates. And in fact, the markets were estimating 190,000 Uh, non-farm payroll jobs being added, and we got 211,000. So we did beat estimates. And in fact, the prior month, which was the one that really shocked everybody, being 271,000, not that it's such a great number. It just shows you how low the bar is for expectations. But they even revised that one up to 298,000. The unemployment rate held steady at 5%. Uh, So this accordingly or supposedly shows that everything is great and the Fed, which is data dependent, and apparently the only data that it depends on is the jobs numbers, uh, that now the Fed is going to raise rates. But again, once again, this was not a strong report any way you want to look at it. The labor force participation rate, 62.5. That's just one-tenth of a percent from the lowest level since the mid-1970s. That is still going in the wrong direction. In fact, we had the biggest surge in the number of people working part-time involuntarily. Better than 300,000 new part-timers who really want full-time jobs. This was the biggest jump in more than three years. Now, Janet Yellen has consistently stated, at least until recently, that before she moves up interest rates, she wanted to see improvement in the job market specifically when it comes to participation and full-time versus part-time jobs. And thus far, that hasn't happened. So why does everybody believe that the Federal Reserve is about to raise interest rates, even though the criteria upon which those rate hikes were supposed to be based has not, in fact, been met? Well, I think one thing that has changed, and in fact, from my perspective, This meeting next week is actually the first time that it's possible that the Fed might, in fact, raise interest rates. Now, I know I've been saying all along that the Fed had no intention of raising rates, and I still believe that that was the case. I think they didn't have any intention to raise rates, but they may have backed themselves up into a corner. And so there is still a possibility, and maybe a strong one, that they will. I think a lot of it is going to depend on what happens in the stock market between now and then, because I still don't believe their minds are made up. I think they want to wait and see. They have floated some trial balloons, which I'm going to get to now, uh, which is kind of like a litmus test to see whether or not they can, in fact, nudge interest rates up by a quarter of a point. One of the uh, ways that Janet Yellen has changed her rhetoric, and this is the first time I've seen her speak this way, and this was at her most recent uh, press conference, which, which happened last week. Instead of saying that she's waiting to see uh, an improvement in labor force participation or uh, full-time versus part-time, she said that she's confident that the improvements are going to happen sometime in the next year or two. So in other words, I'm no longer waiting for the improvements to happen. I'm just confident that they will. So in other words, even though we haven't had the type of improvements I've been holding out for, I may in fact raise rates anyway because I'm so confident that those improvements are going to come. Right? So now she doesn't want to wait to see the improvements. She's just banking that they're going to happen anyway. So that is a change in, in tone. But another thing that is different is that if you remember back at the beginning of the year or late last year, The whole idea behind the first rate hike was going to be, this was going to set into motion a series of rate hikes. It was going to return to normalcy, right? It was the beginning of a long journey. That's why they kept calling it liftoff, right? Liftoff, like a rocket ship. 
right? A rocket ship is going to take a long journey and it's going to go into orbit or outer space, but that journey begins with liftoff, right? It's very dramatic, but it's not the end. It's the beginning of this process, right? Liftoff, liftoff. Well, now, ever since the markets tanked in September, when everybody was bracing for a September liftoff, the Fed chairman has really changed her tune. She's trying to minimize the importance of liftoff by telling everybody that liftoff doesn't matter, right? That it doesn't matter when we have the first rate hike. What really matters is what happens after that, right? It's not liftoff. It's the flight path. It's the trajectory. It's how high do interest rates go and how quickly do they get there? And in fact, what the Fed chairman has really been saying is that, look, we're going to raise interest rates, but don't worry because we may not raise them again anytime soon. And in fact, from my perspective, if we actually get a rate hike next week, that's the only rate hike we're going to get from the Fed, right? It's not going to be the beginning of the tightening cycle. It's going to be the end of the tightening cycle, which actually began a couple of years ago when they first started talking about the taper, right? That was the beginning of the tightening. And I think the first official rate hike, if we actually get one, is going to be the end of that process. And this really takes away all the meaning of the first rate hike, right? It was supposed to, you know, signal the all clear, that the Fed has confidence in the economy, it can begin to normalize rates. Well, if it's telling us now that it's not the beginning of normalization, it's really just a trivial rate hike. And if it's trivial, why even raise rates at all? If the data is still really bad, and it is, right? And certainly when you get beyond the jobs data, manufacturing is already in a recession. Look at the ISM number that came out uh, last week from manufacturing at a six-year low. And even the service sector ISM was way below estimates. Retail sales have been abysmal. Consumer confidence is going down. All signs point that this recovery is ending, right? It's already been, what, six or seven years. It's the weakest recovery ever. I doubt it's going to be the longest recovery ever. It is running out of steam, although it's actually running out of air because it's not even a recovery. It is a bubble. So if the Fed were data dependent, the last thing they would be doing is raising rates. So why are they doing it? Because they feel they have no choice. They feel they've backed themselves into a corner and their credibility is on the line. So really, the Fed is going to raise rates if it does so, not because it feels that it's warranted, but because it's a symbolic gesture you know, to show how confident they are in the economy. But if they really had confidence in the economy, they wouldn't be trying to uh, assure everybody not to worry that there aren't a lot of rate hikes behind this one, right? That this is not really a rocket ship. It's kind of like a hoverboard, right? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, uh, take off, lift off, but then we're not going anywhere. We're just hovering above the launch pad. And eventually, I think the craft is just going to fall back down to earth because we will be in a recession you know, in 2016, an election year, unless the Fed does something to delay the onset of that recession. And I'm not even sure they can do it. It may be too late at this point, And all they can do is try to put out the fire that they've already lit. But you might say, why would Janet Yellen, if she really thought the economy was so weak, why wouldn't she just come out and say so? Well, I think we have a, a pretty good window into the way Janet Yellen thinks and the way she perceives her role if you uh, listen to an interview that Ben Bernanke gave uh, on Freakonomics. And, you know, I listened to it yesterday. And if you want to go, you know, go on iTunes or listen to this interview, um, it's entertaining. And, and certainly most of it doesn't tell me anything new about the Fed chair. You know, I, I had an encounter with him personally and we had a conversation. And, you know, you know in, in this interview, again, he just makes one clueless statement after another to show how little he really understands about the economy or the financial crisis. But probably the most important revelation happened about, I don't know, halfway through the interview. The guy interviewing him, and I forget, I forget the guy's name, but he played some clips of Ben Bernanke on, on television in 2005 and 2006. And, and during those clips, Ben Bernanke was talking about, you know, how, how great the economy was, right? How the U.S. economy was in great shape. 
nothing to worry about. He was minimizing any potential problems in the housing market or the mortgage market, right? Really a cheerleader. And the interviewer said to Bernanke, look, how does it make you feel to listen to this, right? Because after all, you were so wrong about the economy. How do you feel now, you know, listening to those clips? And the very first words out of Ben Bernanke's mouth was, well, you know, I was speaking as a member of the administration. So you really can't expect me to say, you know, run for the hills. And I couldn't believe he, he admitted that. I mean, speaking as a member of the administration? I mean, the Bush administration? No, he wasn't. He was the chairman of the Federal Reserve. When did that become a cabinet post? Or when did that become like a White House press secretary? Basically, what he said is, look, it didn't matter what I was saying. Even if I was worried about the economy, that's the last thing I'm going to do is admit it because I'm a team player. I'm a member of the administration. I have to talk up the economy. I have to sell the president's book, right? I have to uh, stand up for President Bush. I have to pretend everything is great, even though I think it's not. So I thought that was a startling admission on the part of, of, of Ben Bernanke. You know, another thing he said, too, after he said that, he went back and said, but you know, in fairness, the economy was good in 2005 and 2006. So I wasn't wrong. In fact, he said it was good in 2007, right up until the end. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's like saying, yeah, a guy jumps off the top of the Empire State Building and says, well, everything was great. I mean, everything was fine until I hit the pavement, right? Well, of, you know, of course, right? I mean, the minute somebody jumps off the top of the Empire State Building, that's it, right? I mean, it's not fine on the way down, right? The ending is already a foregone conclusion that it's a disaster, right? It's only a question of when you hit the pavement. The mistake is jumping from the top of the building. It's not hitting the pavement. That's just a consequence of your mistake. What Ben Bernanke still doesn't understand is the economy was a disaster in 05 and 06 because it wasn't real economic growth. It was a bubble. And that's why it ended in a financial crisis. If we really had a good economy, it wouldn't have ended in a financial crisis. And that's what Ben Bernanke to this day apparently doesn't understand. And Janet Yellen doesn't understand it either. She thinks this is a good economy, just like Ben Bernanke thought it was a good economy in 2005 and 2006, but it's gonna have the same ending because it's a bubble. And you know, if Ben Bernanke believed that he was a member of the Bush administration, why should we assume that Janet Yellen doesn't think she's a member of the Obama administration? And as a loyal Obama you know, uh, uh, you know, partner or appointee, uh, why should she tell the truth, right? When you see the White House press secretary or you know, secretary of labor on television talking about how great the economy is, everybody knows these guys you know, are not objective, that they're just spinning. So why does everybody assume that Janet Yellen is speaking as an independent voice who is going to criticize the economy if it, you know, if it needs it? She's not. She probably looks at herself the same way Ben Bernanke did. And she is going to continue to pretend that the economy is good. She is going to ignore all the information that shows that it's not good, even if it means raising interest rates by a quarter of a point, even though she doesn't believe that she should, but she's doing it just as a gesture to show that she has confidence in an economy in which she actually has no confidence at all. In fact, if she had confidence in the economy, she would have raised rates years ago. And I think the data dependency line has just been a delay tactic. They didn't want to raise interest rates, so they said they were data dependent. But clearly that wasn't the case because the data they depend on is now the worst it's ever been. Again, other than the unemployment rate. But Janet Yellen has to know that employment is a lagging indicator. Sure, unemployment is always low at the end of a recovery. It's always low when a recession begins, right? Unemployment spikes up during the recession. And when the recession is over, that's usually when unemployment is at its high point. And then it starts to come down in the recovery. And if you look at all the signs in the economy, all the forward-looking leading indicators, they are pointing to recession. Right? And in fact, during Janet Yellen's press conference last week, one of the uh, congressmen or senators, I forget who asked the question, pointed out a new study by, I think, Citigroup that pegged the odds of a recession next year, 2016, at 65%. And Janet Yellen was asked whether she agreed with that 
you know, assessment. And of course, she can't say yes, because if she agrees with it, how can she be raising rates if she thinks that a recession is, is, is so likely? So she said, I disagree. I don't think the probability is that high, although she didn't you know, offer an alternative probability. But this was the most important thing. The, the uh, congressman asking the questions follow up and said, well, what if there is a recession next year? What, what are you going to do about it? You know, what tools do you have uh, to, to fight it off? And Janet Yellen said, well, we have all the tools that we've always had. She said that if it turns out that we've raised interest rates, we'll just lower them, right? So if we raise interest rates to 25 basis points or 50 basis points and we're in a recession, well, we'll just go right back down to zero, right? Which is what I've been saying all along. And then Janet Yellen talked about the quantitative easing program, the asset purchase program, and said that the Fed was prepared to do it all over again because, and I quote, it worked so well the last time. Now, remember, this is what the Fed is going to do if we're in a recession next year. And the Fed says, well, we're going to do exactly what we did before because it works so well. But a recession in 2016 that happens so soon after the first rate hike or happens in the absence of a rate hike, if we're really right back in recession, wouldn't that prove that uh, quantitative easing and 0% interest rates didn't work, right? Because we're right back where we started from. We never achieved a liftoff or escape velocity, that the minute the Fed removed the stimulus, we were right back in recession. That would prove that the stimulus didn't return the economy to some kind of self-sustaining uh, a point. It was simply an artificial prop keeping the economy from imploding. And the minute they removed their plops, the props, you know, down it went. It would be an admission of failure. What the Fed really should do if the U.S. economy is back in recession in 2016 is admit they made a mistake. They should say, you know what? I guess we were wrong. We got to go back to the drawing board and figure out a different approach because this one obviously did not work, right? All of the self-congratulations, uh, the Fed patting itself on the back, you know, what a great job we've done. It's all predicated on a real recovery that no longer needs 0% interest rates, that no longer needs quantitative easing. If we're right back in those programs, that proves that what I've been saying has been right all along, that we are in a monetary roach motel, that we are in a situation from which there is no exit. And I've said from the beginning that there is no exit strategy. There is no way out. There's more QEs than Rocky movies. And if we have to do QE4, again, that's more proof that the Fed is wrong and that what I have been saying is correct. But meanwhile, the markets uh, continue to believe uh, what the Fed is saying. Right. Ignoring the obvious conflict of interest uh, that was just revealed uh, by Ben Bernanke, the markets are still acting as if we're going to have all these rate hikes and as if the U.S. dollar is going to keep on strengthening. That's why you're seeing weakness in emerging markets. That's why you're seeing weakness in commodity prices. You're seeing weakness in oil. You know, one place we're not seeing weakness right now is in gold. You know, the price of gold rose about $40 from its Thursday low to its Friday close. And that was in the face of the stronger than expected uh, jobs numbers that made a, a, the rate hike a lock. Most people would have thought that the price of gold would have continued to slide. In fact, hedge fund investors also, you know, obviously think that you have a record, a short interest now uh, in gold in hedge funds, yet gold rose, which again suggests to me that what I've been saying about buy the rumor, sell the fact, is going to be what happens in gold. And I think the same thing is going to happen in the dollar. But of course, the rumors were of a legitimate uh, tightening, that liftoff was the beginning of a long journey that was going to see a normalization in interest rates. If the fact ends up a trivial one and done quarter point, just so the Fed can pretend that they can raise rates and show the markets that it can, even though it takes all the sting out of it, right? If the Fed does raise interest rates, it's going to be the most dovish rate hike in the history of rate hikes because the Fed is going to try to undo everything that it does. So if that's all we get, you know, the, the fact is not going to jive with the rumor, in which case we're going to have a bigger reaction than we normally would. And of course, if it turns out that the rumor was false, that there is no rate hike, and what might lead the Fed not to hike rates at all? And that would be if this trial balloon ends up being like the Hindenburg, because we still have a little over a week between now and the time the Fed is supposed to hike rates. 
The Dow has been very choppy. We've had some big down days following this relief rally that we had the other day, uh, I think on, on Monday. But um, the, the market is still very vulnerable. The Dow technically looks very vulnerable. And so I think the Fed wants to sit back and gauge the market's reaction to this idea of a, a diminished flight path, of an idea that, hey, just because we raise rates once doesn't mean we got to do it again. Right? that we're going to be very, very data dependent. And everybody can see that the data has been getting worse and worse and worse. And so once we get this, this first rate hike out of the way, who says there ever has to be another one? So I think Janet Yellen wants to see how that sits with the markets. If the Dow is in the vicinity of its highs, then I think the Fed will have the courage to pull the trigger. But if we're tanking again, and we'll see, we know we got another week. If the Dow's down another 1,000 or 1,500 points, I think the Fed will not raise rates and they'll continue to pretend uh, that they're data dependent. Also, in speaking about data, I didn't even mention that the same day that we released the better than expected employment data, we released worse than expected trade data. In fact, the trade deficit not only came out wider than expected, but they upwardly revised the prior month. And in fact, exports were at their lowest level in three years. And even looking at our trade deficit with Mexico was at its widest in, in three years. So if the U.S. economy really were improving, right, you would see the results in trade. In fact, if you remember earlier in this recovery, it was the promise of manufacturing. Manufacturing was supposed to lead the recovery. Exports were supposed to be the key. President Obama promised a, a manufacturing renaissance. Remember that? Well, what we've delivered, what he's delivered is a manufacturing dark ages because that's where we are. We have our manufacturing is falling in the jobs. The jobs report from last uh, last week, sure, we created more jobs than estimated, but we lost manufacturing jobs. That is part of the problem. The good jobs are going away. The jobs people have are the jobs that can't, can't support them. You know, that's why look at consumer credit. You know, consumer credit is still growing, but retail sales are not. Why? Because consumers are using that credit to, to pay for necessities. They're not shopping. They're, just, they're, 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 pay, they're paying their electric bills. They're paying for their groceries. And yes, there is still credit growth in student loans or in the auto sector, but talk about bubbles. That's why you've got lending going on there. You've got huge bubbles in the lending, just like we had in the real estate market. And just like uh, Ben Bernanke wasn't sounding the alarm about those bubbles for the same reason uh, uh, Janet Yellen isn't saying anything about these bubbles. But this is not going to end any, any, any better. All of this data is, is pointing to a weakening economy. And that's why if the Fed doesn't raise rates in December, then there's no rate hikes coming at all. Right. I mean, it's just it's just not going to happen if they don't do it now, then it's just not going to happen. And if they do do it in December, then it's the only time it's going to happen. And believe me, a one and done is not the same thing as the beginning of a tightening cycle. And also remember, it's not just the raising interest rates. It's the shrinking of the balance sheet. Right. Janet Yellen promised and I, and I called her out on this on my podcast or the video blogs. She promised to shrink the balance sheet back down to where it was before the financial crisis, by the end of the decade. Yet, I just mentioned that in response to a question as to what the Federal Reserve was going to do if we're back in recession next year, we'll do more QE. That means the balance sheet is going to grow. So if the balance sheet is going to grow and it's going to get even bigger, how is it going to get down to a trillion at the end of the decade? I mean, did Janet Yellen really believe when she made that statement that the U.S. economy was going to grow without recession until the year you know, 2010? I mean, did she really believe that the weakest economic recovery in history was also going to be the longest economic recovery in history? I doubt that. She is just speaking as a member of the Obama administration, and she wants to talk this economy up. She does not want to have happened to uh, Obama what happened to Bush. Or she doesn't want to have happen, she doesn't want what happened to Hillary Clinton, right? Or what happened, excuse me, what happened to John McCain to happen to Hillary Clinton. Because when you are a, a part of the administration, you want to help reelect 
the administration's party, right? Because all the Democrats that have cushy jobs in Washington, all the people that are in the president's cabinet, a lot of these people are still going to have jobs if Hillary Clinton is the next president, right? It's, it's all the same uh, members of the same team. They're just going to maybe rearrange them a little bit, but all the same guys keep their jobs. But if a Republican is in the White House, then all those jobs go to different people because the Republicans have their own uh, players that they want to you know, give these plum jobs to. So the administration is always trying to keep their team on the field. They always want to keep these good jobs uh, open for themselves. And of course, the president is going to have a lot more access uh, in a Hillary Clinton administration. He's going to be much more important right, in that administration than he would be you know, in the administration of some Republican. So clearly he wants uh, a, a Democrat to follow him. And of course, that is a referendum on his presidency, right? If everybody thinks that, you know, uh, Obama did a good job, well, they're going to uh, elect another Democrat as proof that he did a great job. So this is, this is what the president wants. So obviously it is what Janet Yellen wants. And in fact, Janet Yellen wants to get you know, reappointed. I mean, why not? I mean, it's a, this is an easy job for her. She's not going to get reappointed by a Republican. That's obvious. She's only, her only chance of being reappointed is to make sure that she elects a Democrat. So given that, it's either one and done when it comes to rate hikes or there's no rate hikes at all. And then the question is, when are the markets going to figure this out? Maybe gold has already figured it out. I said earlier, it made a new low, a new six-year low. It got down below uh, 1050 and then had a substantial rally. Gold stocks never confirmed the new low in gold. In fact, gold stocks uh, just recently almost hit two-month highs. So you see a positive divergence there. And gold stocks led bullion lower. Maybe now they're leading it higher. We'll see what happens in the currency markets. We did have a big reversal last week in the euro uh, when Draghi disappointed the markets by not increasing uh, their quantitative easing program. And I recorded a long podcast on that, and I would suggest you go and listen to that rather than have me repeat uh, what I said in that podcast on this video blog. But I think there's a lot of significance to what happened uh, with Draghi and the euro and I think there is, again, a good chance that the euro has bottomed. You do have a lot of shorts in the euro, just like we have a lot of shorts in gold. And I think a lot of people are going to be disappointed. Everybody believes that the ECB is going to be uh, the central bank that's creating more inflation, that's lowering interest rates and doing QE. And they think the Fed is going to be the lone holdout that's among major central banks that's ending QE and going to be raising interest rates. Well, I think all of that is going to be re reassessed because I believe that the Fed is going to be leading the charge when it comes to easy money. We're going to be uh, launching another round of quantitative easing. And I think our program is going to be much bigger uh, than Europe's program. And the markets are not prepared for that at all. Well, that's it for now. And remember, you don't have to wait for my next video blog here on the Shift Report to hear my thoughts on the economy, on the Fed, on what's going on in the markets. You can listen to the Peter Schiff Show podcast. I record those far more frequently, both on shiftradio.com and here on my YouTube channel. Bye for now.